just in case you forgot why you're here or whom I'm going to be speaking to today, allow me just a minute, please. Gregory McGuire is the author of Wicked, The Light and Times of Wicked Witch of the West, Confessions of an Ugly Stepsister, and several other dozen novels uh, for adults and children. Many of McGuire's adult novels are inspired by classic children's stories. Wicked, in particular, uh, transforms the Wicked Witch of the West from Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz into a main, sympathetic, relatable character. This novel inspired the play Wicked. And Wicked became a blockbuster in 2003 on, on Broadway, and since then has become the fifth longest running show on Broadway. <laughs> so Gregory was born originally in upstate New York, uh, took his undergrad at SUNY uh, Albany, and then decided to come to our fair Commonwealth to finish off his advanced graduate studies, taking his PhD uh, in English and American Literature at Tufts University. Besides being an accomplished uh, academic and prolific writer, he's also on the board of many nonprofit, nonprofit public uh, uh, organizations such as the Boston Public Library, the uh, Isabel Stewart uh, Gardner Museum, uh, and Concord Free Press, as well as many others. Now, he happens to live locally, but he's lived uh, in New York, London, and Dublin. We're very happy to have him here. And besides, if, this weren't all enough, if all of this weren't enough, uh, he's also an occasional reviewer for The Times, for the, all the books there. Uh, he's contributed material for NPR's All Things Considered. He's lectured around the world uh, on literature and culture. Uh, his family was featured on Oprah. Uh, he's been profiled in the New York Times Magazine, and his adult novels are regularly uh, uh, on the top 10 list uh, for the New York Times books. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Gregory McGuire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just in case I haven't embarrassed you enough, <laughs> we're actually here to talk about his new book, uh, The Brides of Maricor. Now, I don't know if this is uh, available to the public yet. Just, just, just opened. Yep. Uh, I believe you all can pu uh, purchase this in the local uh, Concord uh, bookstore uh, and, of course, uh, elsewhere. So we're going we're gonna to have a little conversation about what inspired him, what the book is about, some of his insight into things. Uh, so why did you choose this moment in particular, or maybe why did this moment choose you to return to the world of Wicked? That's a great question. First, I have to thank you for your uh, compendious introduction. <laughs> and it's great to see so many friends out here and, and uh, people I partly know, people I know very well, people who are very dear to my heart and, and three or four of you I never met before, but I'm sure we'll exchange, <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll exchange email addresses before the night is out. Is thank you all for coming and thank you to the Concord Players for having me and Jay for, for really such a lovely introduction. Uh, but it's a great beginning question. Why go back to Oz after having left it 10 years ago? Uh, Wicked, the novel, the wonderful, the, the, yeah, what is the title of Wicked? It's called Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West. And that was published more than a quarter century ago, and it was followed by three sequels, Son of a Witch, A Lion Among Men, and Out of Oz. But the last book was written 10 years ago. It was published 10 years ago. And it was called Out of Oz because I wanted to signal to my readers that just as one can be out of Cheerios and one can be out of luck, one can have dipped the scupper one time too many and there is nothing left in the Oz barrel. You have used up everything that was there. I was about to be out of Oz. Um, and so. The, the, the that title actually had three meanings, though. Most of my titles have, have more than one. That title was, yes, intended to say, we're done with this story. This has been a long story cycle that's taken us over three generations, from Elphaba, the Wicked Witch of the West, to her son, Lear, to her granddaughter, Rain. And uh, I wanted to signal to readers, we're going to leave Rain young and with her life ahead of her 
because even fantasy novels have to have an element of reality uh, in order to capture us at all. They have to have some verisimilitude and some uncertainty. What is life if it's not driven with uncertainty? So I thought that's a great place to end a cycle when someone is still young and their life and all their bad choices and all their regrets are still ahead of them. <laughs> so I thought that, that, that really would continue to bolster up this fact that my Oz is intended to remind us of the difficult, crippling, and rewarding lives that we all have here. But there were two other reasons I called it that. The second one was I wanted to emulate those, those books like Out of Africa. Mm. What is the news out of Africa, have you heard? What is the news out of Narnia? Has anybody heard? Has anybody heard from anybody? What, what's the news out of England today? Uh, out of Oz was meant to be the latest news out of Oz and maybe the last news out of Oz. Uh, but finally, the final reason that I named that book Out of Oz is that I wanted it to end on an updraft, if you will. Uh, Rain, the 15, 16, 18-year-old granddaughter of Alphaba, who is green-skinned, it runs in the family, in the matrilineal line, I'm told, uh, actually takes Alphaba's broom, or a flitch off the old broom, and she flies out of the nation of Oz across a newly discovered ocean. She's like, Stout Cortez, as, as the poet called it, silent on the peaks of Darien, although it wasn't Cortez, but it, that's, that's how the poet, how Keats, I think, uh, said. She discovers a new ocean, a new land that most of the people in Oz don't know. She goes out of Oz on the broom with the intention of disappearing the magic book called The Grimmery, of getting it out of Oz. If we could lose the secrets of nuclear weapons, would we drop them in the ocean so that we could save future generations? If we could lose some secrets of the despair people are capable of, would we drop them in the ocean so as to save future generations from sorrow? She intends to do that. And that's where I left her 10 years ago. So your question, I have long-winded questions. We come back in this right. book to find out what happened to her the following week. So, <laughs> so as far as the timing and the motivation for building this book now, would you say then that current events are some catalyst for this too? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, speaking without getting without going down that rabbit right, hole. Right. <laughs> uh, speaking of rain, uh, what was it uh, like? Any anything in particular that inspired you to create this brave, uh, spirited character of rain? It is helpful to have a daughter. It is helpful to have had and still have sisters. How convenient for all of us that we had a mother. You know, these, these women, and I, on top of all that, I had nuns. <laughs> I had hundreds of thousands of nuns and librarians and doctors and strong women my whole life who taught me what it was like to be strong in a world that didn't appreciate them yet or maybe ever. And I've always been compelled by strong women because I could see them taking care of my life, the, the life of the world. And once I had a daughter of my own, I saw how in her life, and I'm talking about this century now because she, is, she was born in this century, how her life is in some ways going to be harder mm -hmm. than the lives of those of us who were born in the distant 1950s. Uh, and, uh, and my heart goes out to young people who have to deal with so much more, such a different uh, set of shimmering, ugh, scary, ghostly possibilities on the horizon of existence than those which in, from the 1954 when I was born to 1968 you know, when I got out of eighth grade. I didn't have to deal with those kinds of pressures. Mm -hmm. And my heart really goes out to those girls particularly, but boys too, any young people, and to their need to be strong. And so I'm compelled to write about young people because <laughs> our future depends on them. Correct. Well, would you say then, it sounds like part of your uh, objective was to have her be aspirational and inspirational in some degree? Uh, yes, but not hagiographically hey, so. Right. And I have to, I say it that way because 
much though I adore the, the musical Wicked, the characterization of Elphaba on the play makes her, turns her from a mistake-riven freedom fighter into somebody just a little bit shy of Mother Teresa. <laughs> I mean, she's so good, she's so earnest, she's so well-meaning, she rarely uh, makes any serious mistakes. Uh, and I want to claim, even for characters in fantasy, I want to claim their right to be bullheaded and foolish and, and to have to live with the tragic errors that they make because that's how we see ourselves in them and that's how they become real. Well, and like, on that same note then, can you tell us about the other characters in the, in, in the novel, The hmm. Seven Brides? Well, it's called The Brides of Maricor. And to explain that title, if I may, Jay, I, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a precy about how this book came together. Books come together a little bit the way dust mice congeal under your bed. <laughs> you know, you keep looking, thinking, is it time to sweep? <clears throat> oh, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna come for a dinner party and go up and lie down on their breastbone and look <laughs> and see what's under the bed. So no, but eventually they turn into something. They turn into shapes. And stories are like that too. You collect what seems like random material and little by little it becomes a shape that you can recognize. I began to think about this story about four years ago. Uh, so it, wasn't, it was pre-pandemic that it, I thought of it. And I began to think about an island of women from all ages, seven, the seven ages of man, only it's the seven ages of women, mm -hmm. from a 10-year-old girl to an 80-year-old woman who have no experience of childbirth or of sex with another gender uh, or, or of men, with one exception, for their entire existence. They are brought to that island as infants and they grow up in a com in this small community of women and they die and are buried on the island. The only male they ever see, the only human male they ever see is an overseer who arrives once a year to count them to see whether a baby needs replacing, uh, see whether supplies or medicines need um, bringing from the mainland and then disappears for another year. So I started this. I like this, uh, this idea of a community of women who would represent some kind of solemnity and also some kind of huge unbreakable ignorance mm. at the same time. Uh, and just as I was beginning to get up a little head of steam on this story, what should happen but that darn old Margaret Atwood should allow Hulu or FX or whatever it was to come out with The Handmaid's Tale starring Elizabeth Moss. And I thought, oh, here I go again. People are gonna think that I'm trying to retell The Handmaid's Tale but set in Oz and it's going to be about the oppression of women and I'm not gonna be given credit for my own ideas. Well, but on that, so, but each of these characters is unique, and they all have very, very clear, distinct personalities. So, what, what, what was behind each of their individual? Well, they they did sort of come up and speak their own voices um, to me, uh, but slowly, uh, and I didn't want them to represent all of humankind. Just as when you write a children's book, the child protagonist doesn't, you know, can't represent all children. They they at best can represent some lumpy part of childhood, but they can't represent all children, nor should these women, even seven of them, represent all of feminine existence. Mm -hmm. But they do represent some of the issues and problems that might occur uh, in small communities where you don't have enough variety and you have also been deprived of knowledge about how other people are. Uh, and this was also a result of my watching women being cut out of situations in history, in the past, cut, cut out of the records, cut out of the careers, cut out of the trades, and deprived of access to lots of things that make humans humans. And so I, wanted, I just wanted to think about that. And each one sort of woke up and spoke her own name. Well, was there anyone in particular who spoke to you more strongly than the others? Do you have a favorite? The, the oldest one, whose name is Helia, and that's a word that derives from the Greek for son, uh, uh, is cranky and bitter, and I think she uses bad language, and so I love her. 
<laughs> so what were you, did you have any particular objective in mind, you, uh, identifying her, creating her? No, she just, she, she just started growling at me. And all, <laughs> you know, all, all I had to do, it's like magic writing, all I had to do was take dictation, say, could you speak a little, a little more slowly, dear? You know, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to get this down, if you don't mind. Um, well, speaking of being more slow, so here we are, you know, 25 years later of the Wicked era. Uh, how has that shaped your, uh, your, your creativity, how you look at the world? The, the truth about my, my career since Wicked, because it, it, I had 15 or 16 years before that, is um, undoubtedly the, su the surprise success of the novel brought me a, a level of uh, professional recognition and creature comfort that I had not enjoyed hitherto. Yes, I understand. Uh, <laughs> I'm still <laughs> living that life. <laughs> and so what, it, it did two things to me. It both liberated me to be able to leave other jobs and concentrate on my writing, mm -hmm. but success is its own box too. Right. Because as soon as Wicked started selling better than even the publisher had expected, her suggestion to me was, why don't you take Alice in Wonderland and rewrite Alice in Wonderland for us? <laughs> now, I have since actually done that, but I didn't do it right away because, Jay, what I said was, look, I don't want to be known as the grown-up writer who's kind of needs a whole lot of therapy and is stuck in childhood <laughs> right. and, is, and is rewriting children's books because he's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and so uh, I just, uh, I resisted a little bit, but I, by that point I had children to feed yeah. and I had a mortgage to pay and I thought you have to, you, you do have to, you have to do what, what, what works. Now the truth is, and you hinted at this, Jay, in your introduction of me, as my career has gone on in the 25 years since Wicked, I realized that yes, almost all my novels for adults have been based on some plinth or other that has to do with some original children's story. And I realized what I've been doing is actually never, I hope, parodying mm -hmm. or making fun of original source material. But in every instance, what I'm doing is trying to tip the hat Correct. to the original creators and to say, thank you, by the way, for rescuing me. Thank you, by the way, for giving my imagination nutrition and giving my soul and my spirit windows to open and magic carpets to get on and get away from my six siblings and get away from the cheery nuns and all that guitar singing. Thank you for bringing me someplace else. And so my adult career has been an act of homage to the people who have written before me. Excellent. Excellent. Let's get back into the book for just a second. So the Brides of America War follows various characters throughout the book. Uh, was this always, you know, this is kind of the way it's structured in terms of how you focus on this character, that character, that character for a certain period of time. Was that always the case? I mean, did you always have that in mind as far as how you were going to frame the story? No. I, I'm the kind of writer who gets things set up. And I think it's, I, I, I've now, be, I've come around to likening it to a jazz quartet, only I'm playing all the four parts. Right. You know, I get it going. I, de I decide on the, the tempo or the tempi. I decide on the keys. I, I pretty much pick the instruments. And then I say, and we're live. And somebody starts to... And they're off and running, and I just follow them with my typewriter and, and, and watch and see what they do. So would you say then that from the very beginning you heard all the voices as opposed to thinking about the possibility of only focusing on rain? That as you, because I think you answered this actually when you talked about the island of women yeah. as sort of the, the premise for the start. So it sounds like then in, from the, the beginning you were thinking about presenting all. Well, not exactly. The, 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 uh, the main male character in the book because uh, into this island of woman, women, excuse me, comes Rain, the green-skinned girl. She crash lands off the broom and is washed ashore on the island. And if you haven't happened to read all 1,500 pages of the previous books, <laughs> it's okay because Rain suffers a very useful bout of amnesia. And she doesn't know what her past is, so you don't need to know it either. You learn it as she learns it. But I'm learning it too because my method as a writer is to just follow the themes and, and see whether I can chime in from time to time. 
Lusicles is the name of the overseer. He comes to the island, you know, halfway through part one to do that counting and discovers that instead of there being fewer than seven brides on the island, because that's the requisite for devotional purposes, there's one extra. What? There are eight. What right. does this mean? This throws devotional practice out the window and, mm -hmm. and, and sends him into consternation. And then, uh, so, I, you know, as he rows back to the boat, I'm like in a little rowboat after him saying, <laughs> don't row so fast. I have to hear what you're saying. I have to, I have to see what's going to happen when you climb back onto your boat and go back. To, I guess you're going back to the mainland. Well, I guess, bye, brides. I'll see you later. I'm going to the mainland with Lusicles. So I just follow along and see what happens. Got it. So it sounds like even though Rain uh, is the carryover character from the prior trilogy, she was never going to ever be just the sole focus of this new set. No, I don't think I don't think I thought that. Yeah. I did. I do know that she is the connecting tissue Correct. because this is the first of a trilogy, and in fact, I have I have drafted the other two books already. Excellent. Well, I'm sure we can't all wait for that, <laughs> can we? Um, so, seeing as how we're in a theater right now, I did want to ask this question about your thoughts as it relates to um, looking back at Wicked uh, at this time when the world of Broadway was shuttered, uh, but it's now reopening. Yeah. Uh. Has it reopened? I was there the night that Wicked opened again after 18 months. Wow. And I'll tell you, if I thought attending a Broadway opening for a play based on one of my works was the most exciting moment in my life professionally, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Because to go back to the theater with, filled with 1,700 people masked, just as you all are here, only two of whom had never seen the play before. <laughs> uh, and, to, and to hear the, the ecstasy, it was actually, the energy was so incredible that it was almost frightening. Right. And I really mean that. Uh, the play opens, you know, the downbeat comes, bum, 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 the monkeys come scurrying down and they caper around the stage and, it, and the audience is going wild and screaming and shouting. And at one point, just before, the monkeys begin to raise the scrim curtain and the story to start behind it. One of the monkeys, and this has happened for 17 years, uh, one of the monkeys turns and, and you know, claws his way to the front of the stage as if just noticing the audience and goes, <laughs> and on, on, on September 15th, the monkey went, <laughs> and the audience went, <laughs> <laughs> it was like Rocky Horror Picture <laughs> Wicked Show. And, and the, all the jokes were so hoary and well tried, but they all got new laughs as if it was like, Grandma's back and she's telling the same jokes. And everyone's <laughs> laughing with joy. And, and Galinda starts coming down in her bubble. And people start clapping 30 seconds before, before the cast member even says, look, it's Galinda. Yeah. And they're just, it, was, it was thrilling, but a little scary. Sure. Well, I mean, I think we've all had this pent-up desire. I can speak for most of the people here, and thank you guys again for coming. Yeah, really. Uh, just to continue with this theme for just a second, so The Brides of Miracor is releasing into this world right now after the theaters have been shuttered, you know, and yeah. Broadway's reopening, et cetera. Um, what do you think, or do you have some ideas about how this book might impact theater enthusiasts? What a good question, and uh, luckily I'm really ignorant about that. I, I don't have any idea. Um, I do know that there are, s there are still more downstream efforts to get the story of Wicked, which now seems to be a story that's free-floating beyond the confines of the novel uh, that, that launched it, and the confines of the MGM 1939 film and the original 1900 novel by L. Frank Baum. It just is kind of its own self. Wicked, the, the, the film of the musical, is going to start shooting this coming summer in London. Mm -hmm. I just, just learned this week. Uh, and ABC Hulu has bought TV rights for a non-musical iteration of my novels that I think maybe will return some of the more sin sinister aspects mm -hmm. to the story. You know, it's not, it's not been quite so sweetened and uh, uh, that's, that's their plan at any rate. This may all happen in 50 years, you know, so I'm not, you know, I'm not holding my breath for any of it. But that's a, a long way around to say 
uh, ABC Hulu has been interested in the three sequels to Wicked mm -hmm. in a way that the musical theater people can't be because the stories end differently. Right. And so this, who knows, this may fly into their lives too. Well, we'll have another set of trilogies. And <laughs> it'll be awesome. Yeah, really. Uh, coming back to the, the themes of this book, so there's um, false piety, I think, mm -hmm. uh, myth versus magic, uh, certainly wildness versus obedience. Uh, how do these serve the times that we're in now? It's interesting that when I did go back to the, that clutch of 35 pages that I abandoned because I was scared of Margaret Atwood finding out where I lived, uh, <laughs> I, I, I did not decide to go back to it until about a day after sequestration was announced mm. and, and kids were sent home from schools not to return and we were told to stay in and we were told to be careful. And I know myself well enough, Jay, and I think you're coming to understand this, that I would have gone mad yeah. if I didn't have something to do. Yeah. And I needed a horizon and a landscape that was larger than my beautiful Concord backyard. I love my Concord backyard, I love living here, but I needed to see something that was wild and cryptic, ungovernable and discoverable. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, I certainly find that to be the case yeah. in a number of places in the book, which is, keeps you engaged and literally like what's going to happen next. Yeah. Um, so what do you hope readers will take away f after reading The Brides of Miracle? An absolute appetite to read the next book in the series. <laughs> I knew it. You know, I was thinking about making the plug for that, but I thought, no, let him say that. Yeah. It's going to be, it's gonna be a, year, a year out, but it's going to be called The Oracle of Maricour. The Oracle of Maricour. And, and I, I, I will say that when the wicked, the, the first four books are called The Wicked Years. And basically, they do detail from the, the, the early marriage of Elphaba's parents to uh, the 18 year old um, state of her granddaughter. So that's, a, that's about you know, 80 years or 75 years or something uh, by the time you get there. Uh, so I was talking to some kids because a lot of middle school and high school kids have taken up my novels. They're called crossover novels, even though they're published for adults. And one kid raised his hand and said, I want to know, you know what, what the next book is because I got to the end of Out of Oz. I have to know what happens. And I said, well, that is the end, actually. Uh, you can write it yourself after I'm dead and you wait 75 <laughs> years. Uh, and, uh, and I said, besides, it's called The Wicked Years. And you know what? By evacuating the Grimmery, which has done so much damage, in, in the world and in Rain's life, the wicked years are over. She has succeeded. She may be broken, she may be bent, she may be unhappy in love, but she has succeeded at 18 in doing something good for the future. So that's the end of the wicked years. Wicked is done. Wickedness is done. And he said, well, I have an idea. I said, kids always have ideas. I love it. I love it. And I said, what? He said, you could write another series and you could call it the happy years. <laughs> and I said, that's a really good idea. But in every joke, there's, there's an element of truth yeah. because our lives are not over. Even when we're absolutely down on the floor, you know, crawling like, like a roach that's been sprayed with rage, we're not, you know, until we stop moving, we're not done. There are things to do. And that's really what I felt when I decided I had to go back. You know, everybody was in trouble. And Rain is part of my family. She was in trouble too. I had to go back 10 years later and see what had happened to her three or four or five days later. Was she okay? It's like having a second family. It sounds like hope is a big driver in your life. It better be. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm just going to be left at the side of the road. You know, <laughs> I want to keep going. I hear you. Ho hope is the necessary fuel. So can you tell us a little bit about the uh, writing process uh, for the book? And in particular, I'm interested about your decision to use, uh, in certain places, sh shorter um, uh, chapters, which strike me as being almost like haiku or poet poems. And so there's kind of two things. One is you know the general writing process, and then your decision to s structure the chapters as you did. One of the reasons that I do sometimes use short chapters is not to discourage my readers. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I, have a, I have an appetite for 19th century long-winded Dickensian novels. Right. I like novels that begin when you know, David Copperfield is born and end when Anna Karenina throws herself on the train tracks. You know I, mean? right. I like, I like the, the full panoply of life. Yes. And yet I know 
we are raised in, a, in an era in which our, all of our attention spans, mine included, are shrinking. So I try to be kind to my reader, especially in the first half of a book, by, by including short chapters and giving people reasons to pause and say, well, I'll sludge through this till the end of the next, oh good, it's the next page. <laughs> the end of the next chapter. That's how I read too, I know, I know how it works. Excellent. Um, actually, when I look at this, I think we already covered this one. How did the success of Wicked influence the writing? I think we already covered yeah. that one. <laughs> Trash it. Um, so you referenced Rain just now as being part of your family. So what exactly makes her part of your family? What do you have in common with her? What does she have in common with you? Well, I'm going to answer. That's a really good question, too. You're full of good questions. Can you just come out on the road with me and just like be Absolutely, my, my, as long yeah. as your publicist <laughs> comes with us. Um, the, uh, the fact is, um, the same question is asked to me of, about Alphaba often. And I think, when, sometimes when I am not sure what to do in my life as a, as a citizen, because that's where I make a lot of my important choices, I think, what would Alphaba do? Mm -hmm. And I, then sometimes I do it, but I think Alphaba is, she's smarter than I am, and she's braver, and she's faster, and she's swifter. And, uh, and then I think, you know, it's a little, uh, you know, maybe onanistic to look up to a character that I made m up myself. I mean, you know, <laughs> that, you know, again, like, doctor, doctor, <laughs> do, yeah. you have, do, you, do you have Saturday hours? Uh, uh, and, um, and yet with Rain, and this is to answer your question, because she's younger and because she is part, she's, part, she's her father's daughter mm -hmm. and her mother's, as well as her grandmother's granddaughter. And in that way, she is, uh, she's more timid and she's more uncertain, and so she's more like me. And so we're kind of like cousins. Okay, well, uh, including the other seven brides and yeah. Lucilies, what do you have in common with any of them? Uh, they all they all want to survive beyond the last page of this book, <laughs> and, and so do I. You know, uh, you know there is there, no, there is a there is a kind of. Well, let me put it this way: when my kids were little, and I would get annoyed at them for not taking my advice, let's say, uh, I, I found myself using a metaphor that I didn't like. And I thought, this has been given to me by Western civilization and by prosperous American civilization, too. I would say, do you know, do you know how much that cost? Mm -hmm. you know? and, and I would think, really, I, I would hear those words coming out of my mouth, and I'd say, I don't really care how much it costs. I mean, the cost isn't the issue. But that's all I could, that's what I would revert to. Uh, and, 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 I, and I thought, I said, well, what is this really about, Gregory? It's not about the money, so stop using a metaphor for cost when you're talking about something of value. Right. You want something, you want to say something else. And I realized, I never did find the right phrase for it, but I realized that the concept I was trying to communicate when I said, do you know how much I spent on that? Do you know how long I had to work to buy that car? You know, right. what I really wanted to say is there is a pulse in life and I am sharing this pulse with you and on your behalf. Do you, know how do you know how much pulse my taking care of you costs? You are taking it lightly. Correct. You are taking it for granted. And in a way, that's your job as children. But in another way, it's also your job to learn what pulse is when somebody else is pulsing for you. So this is a long-winded way of going back to your question about my characters. I want them to pulse. Right. I want them to pulse in the page, and I want to have pulsed with them so earnestly that when readers close the book, they will still be wondering, well, what, what's going to happen to Rain next? And what's going to happen to Lucicles because he cheated on his wife? And what's going to happen to that little girl who was accused of, of a terrible crime? And what's going to happen to all of them? I have, invent I have invested my pulse in reading this 328-page novel, and now I want my pulse to pay off because I'm interested. The pulse is paying off because now I'm interested in their lives too. They've become part of my family. That's what characters in books That's do. Perfect, and it does. You, you've infused the values that you hold dear 
as it relates to recognizing the importance of not being a certain way and trying to be another way in representation in each of these characters, yeah. uh, which is excellent. So as you were writing this, I mean, what additional perspectives did you acquire for yourself? And as I say, as you're writing and you're doing this work, how did the work impact you? And how did it, did it, did it have any influence in terms of perspective that you have uh, as, a, as, an adult, as a person in the real world? I suspect it did influence me, but one of the reasons I'm a writer, Jay, is that I'm real, uh, you know, I'm Irish, so I can, I can talk for hours, <laughs> but I'm, I'm a slow thinker. Mm -hmm. So th come back to me in about four years and say, so how did writing The Brides of Maricor affect you? And by then I will have an answer. But right now, I don't know beyond this. We've had 18 months of the pandemic, and I'm still here. You're here. Yeah. I think we can all stand back. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. So I'm sure we're all avid readers. Um, what are you reading right now? Well, I read a terrific novel about two weeks ago called No One Is Talking About This. I don't know if anybody's read that. Patricia Lockwood is shortlisted for the Booker, and I think it should get it. I've read two or three of the Booker uh, shortlists this year. It is 220 pages, so much shorter than Brides of Maricor, but much harder to read, so don't make a choice. <laughs> uh, it really is hard to read, but about on page 39, she, she tips her hat and tells us what it's about. It's about the, the writer's or the protagonist's observation that the internet and all the related family urgencies of the internet, like Instagram and Facebook and everything else on which we get our, our feeds, as it were, is not like the stream of consciousness novel of James Joyce, right. but she thinks the internet, the portal she calls it, is the stream of consciousness of the world. The internet is the stream of consciousness mm -hmm. of the world. And when I got to that line, I thought, finally I know what this stupid, boring book is about. <laughs> and then I flipped to the beginning and started reading it again. So I'm giving you, you don't have to read it twice. Um, I'm giving you like the key. That's the key. That's what it's about. It's in all these little discrete chunks, but it builds in a way that it had me closer to sobbing at the end of mm -hmm. that book than I have been in 20 years reading a novel. That's, and I cry easily. That's so, huge. You know. Well, I cry at commercials too. So <laughs> it's I really, so <coughs> that's like, that's at the top of my mind, even though I, I, I'm also rereading Tender is the Night at Perfect. the moment because I haven't read that for about 38 years. Tender is the Night by uh, Fitzgerald. Excellent, thank you. Uh, that's perfect, because I mean, we're all looking for new ideas besides this one, which of course is yeah. why we're here in the first place. Um, last thing is, um, anything else that you can tell us about what's in store for rain? I, I will tell you that, back to that kid who said, how about the happy years? Uh, I decided I did want to, I did want to give readers an extended look at what happens to her next, but I didn't want it to stretch out over, say, the 38 years of Elphaba's life, or now the 42 years of her son Lear's life, roughly 42, uh, but I wanted to look at six or eight months of Rain's life. So instead of calling this the years, it's not even a year. So the title of the sequence is, the subtitle, not the wicked years, but another day. It's just another day. And it comes from the poem, rain, rain, go away, come again, another day. And in that poem is the architecture of what the three novels is about. Rain, rain, go away, come again, another day. Whenever we make a journey, we are different when we return than we were when we started out. Whenever we read a book and we close, last page, we are a different person. We are slightly stronger, wiser, broadened, older, wizened, hungry than we were before we started out. Amen, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately that uh, concludes this portion of our event tonight. We're gonna retire into the lobby uh, where uh, I believe you're prepared to sign some books. So if you'd be so kind as to help me saying thank you one more time to Ms. McGuire. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.